some oddballs for us to look at this week. We're going to start off with a lap steal. And I understand there's only six people in the entire world who are anxious to see lap steals. But I like those people. And this is a cool one. This is a Gibson BR3, which is kind of rare. We won't be converting this to a Spanish, although you could actually play it if you've got big enough hands. Um, it, the back of the neck is rounded. These were only made for about one year, I think. Sources are slightly inconclusive, but definitely 1946. It's slightly fancier replacement, the BR4, which had binding on it, started being sold in 1947 at some point. Anyway, there's not a whole lot of them. It's a great design, I'm sure you'll agree. It's so of the period. You know, it feels like it could be at home in a bowling alley, or an automat, or next to a big console radio set with a little bit of, maybe a little western swing playing in the background. And it's in really good shape. Apparently there's a tone knob which is no longer toning. And it's had some replacement tuner buttons, but the owner is not wild about them because they are Ivoroid, and the originals were not Ivoroid, and this offends his sensibilities. To be honest, virtually every example I've seen online seems to have had its buttons replaced. It must have been a particularly bad batch of celluloid. So let's plug it in and see what it does. Interesting offset jack plate. Appears to be tortoise plastic. Lots of volume. on. You got your tone, you got your super tone. You either mud or ice picks. So let's carefully remove the plastic here. You just know that the company that produced this six months earlier was making canopies for Grumman F6F Hellcats or something. It's thick. Okay, you'll have a look at the pickup. Great big single coil, non-adjustable, individual magnet uh, pole pieces. So it's kind of like a cross between a P90 and something like a Jazzmaster pickup. Kind of impressive. Well, I don't think there's enough wire to let me flip that without taking the jack plate off. I just got a whiff of something that smells like, well, it's hard to describe, but 1940s electronics. A very distinctive kind of fragrance from the insulation that was used. It's almost like ozone or something. It's, it's a complex smell, but it's also very attractive. I want to be pretty careful taking off this plate. Like, I could make another one, but I really don't want to. You know, once you get back into the 40s, the components, everything is thicker, you know? It's a bit more sturdy. Yeah, that is a piece of tortoise plastic. Of course, I'm also going to get hung up by the grounding wire for the bridge. Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay, so the jack is actually too large to fit through the hole. It has to be wired from outside. Uh, is there enough slack? No, I don't feel comfortable about that. You know, the hole is big enough for the wire, but not the actual body of the jack. And the jack itself is one of these antique designs where you've got the barrel and the spring for the contact on one side, and the connection points for the wires on the other. And these wires have been wrapped around the eyelet, so I think I want to suck the solder from them to start off with. Get my powerful 60 watt soldering iron here. Should remember to put on my safety glasses before I do this.
Okay, we got pot codes visible. And again, these 40s pots are really stoutly made. So, is it like VC16289 would be the component part. IRC is a manufacturer, 607, I'm taking to be the seventh week of 1946. Also, we have a 0 0.02 microfarad cap, oil and paper. I don't see anything seriously wrong. I'm just hoping that flushing out the pot's going to cure whatever ails it. Now, the access holes on these are pretty, pretty small in comparison to more modern CTS style pots. I don't know if that'll even get in there. And we'll see. There's a little crack in the dimple on top too. Try and get as much in there as we can. Got this little jack assembly here with some alligator clips so I don't have to actually solder this thing together again yet. Yeah, that, that seems to be better. I believe it's an audio taper pot with um, quite a sharp ramp. There's not not spread out over the entire turn. It's mostly bunched up towards one end. But that seems better than it was. I think there's uh, more usable stuff going on there. And it might be a shame to try and replace that pot, uh, given everything else is so original. Here's the electronics cavity. Looks like someone had to come along here with uh, a router and make a little relief cut. And inside, there's pencil marks. It says 98. Give your screws a turn backwards before you start going forwards. That'll let the thread settle into the previous grooves and you don't end up uh, stripping them out as easily. Okay, hooked up, not all that happy. I mean, there's a very short length of travel, but it gets noisy, noisy. And it's as if there is no string ground. I gave the bottom of the bridge a quick swipe with some sandpaper just to make sure it's clean. And uh, I don't see any reason why this wouldn't make good contact. So I'll go through this again, removing my carefully done solder. See if we can read these pots. This is the tone pot. Do that by bridging the outside lugs with my probes here. 493k ohms, these are 500k pots, that would make sense. And this guy I probably won't be able to get a reading off of because it's attached directly to the pickup. And uh, that's likely going to be, who knows what these things are rated at. Nine point four k ohms, so yeah, fairly beefy output. Um, but I can't measure the pot itself. I'll still get the same reading because it's in the same circuit. Um, and the volume pot seems to be working anyway, which makes me wonder about some of the solder joints. They look good, like they don't look super gray and chalky, but maybe we should reheat them and see. It's not enough to reflow the solder that's there. You have to add some fresh as well.
One thing I think I will do, out of an overabundance of caution, is to put a little strip of heat shrink tubing over the uh, um, shielded braid cable uh, because of the way this is designed I suppose there's some chance that it could contact the tip of the switch if things got jostled around in the right way. That did the trick. Okay, changing tuner buttons. I've done it before. We'll do it again. It's something that happens. The older tuner buttons made of celluloid occasionally develop a condition we call a celluloid rot. And uh, the volatile compounds in them start to basically, well, liquefy, <laughs> turn to cheese. Um, these ones someone has put on, you can see this one here is actually sort of sunk below the level of the um, the headstock. They just, just got away with it. Uh, I think we want a little more space. Um, have to be careful with these, obviously, because the grommets or ferrules uh, are definitely going to be loose. They almost always are. And they like to go skittering away across the shop floor when you're not looking. These are old style. They have the peened on gears rather than screws. Some of them are a bit looser than others. Uh, it can be difficult to make any serious change to them uh, in terms of the tension. Like sometimes you can like squeeze the uprights, the posts that hold them. Um, that's a dangerous game, but it can be possible to tighten them up a little bit. Anyway, in use the gears are going to be pulled towards the um, the capstan so they tighten up just through string tension but they can be kind of alarming without the strings on because they're very loose so I'm going to take these off probably do them one at a time so they'll all go back in the same order they came out of the headstock okay you take that out and well, there goes the ferrule I'm going to snip this off using some end nippers. You can see the gear its actually loose. They come right out. Okay, so I'm going to nip off these old ones. I'm not certain how old they are, actually. Uh, these were put on with something that looks like glue, I imagine. And they were quite hot when they were put on, to the point where these actually have become scorched. And uh, they shrunk up around the post in a way that doesn't look natural, if you've seen a lot of old tuners before. But uh, in other news, they're pretty clean, which is a good thing. Sometimes they can be a real mess, and you got to spend 20 minutes picking all of the residue out of the little uh, spear point crenulations. I'll just use a little scotch bright pad to clean them up. Okay, I've got my little squeezy jig here which helps to hold the parts together while I'm squeezing them. And I'm going to use my little butane torch here to provide the heat. Sometimes I use my 60 watt soldering iron which seems to work okay as well. Okay, it's starting to smell hot. Great. And going for an exposure of about eh, eight and a half, nine millimeters. I actually really dislike these peened on tuners. Uh, the loose shafts because there's a little journal um, just underneath the wheel there that you have to line up with the base plate before you try and stick it in 
and it just wants to continuously lean over like the Leaning Tower of Pisa and uh, it won't go through the ferrule so it's, it's kind of a juggling act to keep things together the other thing with um, this instrument is the um, spacing for the holes is not equidistant from the edge of the headstock it's slanted which means that each post should theoretically be its own uh, length before it hits the um, the button, which makes for slightly annoying times. I actually don't like these tuners with the peened on shafts very much because they're loose and, well, they have a tendency to lean when you're trying to install them. There's a little journal here just under the uh, capstan and that has to be fit into the base plate, although it's kind of sloppy. So it's sort of a, a balancing act. you got to push on one side to keep it straight, while also trying to position the ferrule. It's like a handful of baby teeth. Okay, i got strings on. That's one thing about dealing with lap steel people, is every time you see them, they're going to have a new tuning. Totally confounding weird string gauges. In this case we've got E, G sharp, A, B, C sharp, and E. A little wah-wah action here. tone, yeah, everything is within a quarter turn. Here's something just a little bit different. This is a Roland G707 from 1984. It's a guitar interface for MIDI processing. Some of you kids might not know about MIDI. Um, in the early 80s, when electronic music was really starting to take off, you had different manufacturers uh, producing various instruments, and at a certain point they realized that everyone had their own proprietary uh, software or you know, protocols, they couldn't talk to each other. There's no communication between different manufacturers' instruments, which could be a bit of a hindrance when you're trying to, you know, play in a band or compose music or something. So they got together and came up with one single protocol. And, um, you know, this was a period when companies were trying to stretch out and maybe predict or define what digital music was going to look like for the performer for the coming years. And there was competition to get in early and grab the market share. Roland, of course, is still one of the premier names in keyboard technology, and they wanted to see if they could do the same thing for guitars. There's another company out of England that made another kind of synth controller around the same time called the Synthax. 
that took it a step further. Uh, it had strings for you to depress, but there were no pickups. You know, it was, it didn't make any sound at all. It just drove a set of circuits. Alan Holdsworth was an adopter. Um, this one is more like a guitar. It relies on a big pedal board processor, which unfortunately I don't have. In some ways, these are the grandparents of the Aero Band guitar. Remember that one? The Kickstarter campaign from a couple years ago. It had the silicone strings, ran into issues when several YouTube guitarists started to be a little too honest in their paid reviews, and the company threatened to sue them all. It's kind of funny. Electric guitars resist being pulled into the MIDI processing world. They're a strange mix of analog technologies, which were wildly novel at the time of their creation back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Very forward thinking. But now they're kind of locked in, and they resist being modified into a more digital culture, you know. It's a world where we still use vacuum tubes, or valve technology, and that somehow coexists with built-in software amp emulators. Makes no sense to people who are outside our little realm. Uh, we're archaic and futurist at the same time. The 707 here and its cousins were played by two big names. Number one, Jimmy Page recorded the soundtrack for Death Wish 2, of all things, the Charles Brunson vehicle. And then Andy Summers of the police toured with another similar Roland model, the GR303, during the 80s, and he would pull it out every night for a couple of numbers. But in terms of lasting inroads, the guitar is kind of an imperfect vehicle for synth technology, because so much of what makes a guitar sound like a guitar are the artifacts of the physical effort needed to play it, you know? It's just easier and makes more sense to use a keyboard that's laid out chromatically in front of you in a row with presets right next to your hands. And speaking of presets, the preset sounds for this thing are very, very 1980s. It's perfect for your Gem and the Holograms cover band. Maybe you want to play Tom Sawyer by Rush and you need that synth sound to start it off. I know that was an Oberheim, not a Roland. Don't get at me, Rush geeks. I know, I know. But, you know, there are playlists on YouTube where people demo it. You'll be able to hear them. I can't do that for you. And it's pretty wild. So, you know, it's got that retro tech charm, but it also functions as a real guitar with actual magnetic humbucking pickups attached to a high-quality Japanese-made solid body, which is ergonomically the weirdest thing you're ever going to see. I'm not going to try and sit down to play it, that's for sure. The issue is, the owner moved to a new house, and something in the humidity dryness complex went off the charts, because there was a little tiny explosion that happened at the end of each fret, and in some cases chipped the finish right off, or in others has caused it to bubble. You can see that it's a sort of ghostly, it's just hanging on by a thread. And, you know, in other words, the wood of the fretboard shrank back to a point under the length of the frets and the lacquer, or more likely the polyurethane, couldn't deal. So we're going to come back and try, first of all, to make sure none of the ends are protruding at this point, uh, and then seal them back up. I mean, the headstock on this thing, like, it doesn't have the same DNA, but it, it has the shades of the Parker fly. It really is kind of amazing. I'm not sure it comes across in video, but this bar thing here is not in the same plane as the neck. It's actually stepped back slightly because of a sort of a facet that's carved into the body. So it's actually a little more comfortable to play than you might suspect. Uh, I'm not sure this bar thing has any purpose other than to look cool. <laughs> While it's here we might as well check the setup. Action might be a little bit high. Well, no, it's 464 on the base side and about 4 64ths on the treble. Now, there does seem to be a little bit of excess relief in the neck. Yeah, the relief is about 15 thousandths. I think it's a bit much. A Japanese product from the 1980s. I'm going to expect the truss rod is probably 4 millimeters. And it is. So I'm going to give that a little tighten. Or not. It feels extremely snug. Yeah, 11 thousandths is all I'm going to be able to coax out of the truss rod. And that's where it's going to live.
Uh, this thing is not going to get a whole lot of play. I know there's someone out there dreaming of appearing on a stage full of space lasers, but let's be honest, this was never anyone's primary instrument. This is maybe a curiosity, and uh, I'm not going to risk breaking the truss rod. i got to say the trem system is kind of cool. It's ball end, uh, but top loading, which is kind of nice to see. The whole thing sort of sinks down into the body in a way that's kind of satisfying. I like it. I think we're duty bound to have a look under the cover, aren't we? Just to familiarize ourselves and see what we might encounter if we had to actually fix something in one of these. I'm not going to play around too much. Eh, missing a little lacquer here by this pivotal screw. Maybe we can put a dollop on there before we put it back together. Seal that up. Um, and because the MIDI port and the jack are connected to it, I think we want to be pretty careful. <laughs> Lots of fun. Don't take this one out under the rain machines if you're making your music video. Up the drops of the black lacquer. Fill that bad boy up. To rebond what's left of the finish on the fret ends, I'm going to be using some cyanoacrylate or super glue. I keep a number of different viscosities and formulations on hand, but for this job, I actually prefer the old school um, all purpose crazy glue in the hardware store pack, the tiny little applicator. I've got a whip tip on there. This is just a uh, thin, flexible plastic tip, which allows very um, precise applications. Uh, people get surprised, but the thing is, I like that it is really thin, but it takes a little bit longer to cure than some of the more boutique formulations uh, from other companies. Gives me a little bit of extra working time and allows it to penetrate. I haven't said that in a long time. Penetration being paramount. It lets it get all the way in there before it kicks off. You can see the little light colored bubble right at the end of the fret. And that will change it from translucent to clear and bond the old finish. Sometimes if it's obvious there's no place for the glue to get in there, I can take my scalpel and make a tiny little poke down at the base of the fret and give it a means of ingress. Like that. I'll lightly sand the ends of the frets using some micro mesh and then buff up using some automotive compound. and polish the top surface of the frets. There are several interesting things about the setup. The non-height adjustable roller saddles have a lower radius than the fretboard for one, as does this sensor. The D-string is too close to it. It was causing a buzz. Upon playing, I discover there are lots of frets that need spot dressing, which I'll work on over the next few days. As a guitar, it's okay. Ergonomically, it's not as bad as some. I'm sure it's a lot more fun hooked up into a synthesizer, but I'll put on a little phaser and echo and do my best. <laughs> 